Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer tonight. You stand to your feet and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. You know why we do this? Here's why. Because who cares what men have to say? Is that right? Yeah, you know, politicians say one thing, education system says another thing, your neighbors and relatives say something totally different, and, and, and you know, the devil's knocking, trying to, listen, who cares what's out there? I'm not here to hear philosophies and ideologies of man or what people want to pontificate about or some, uh, you know, uh, sugar-coated mess. I'm here to hear the word of God. I want to hear what God has to say about life. I want to know what God wants to put into my life. I want to hear the now word, the, well, God, what are you speaking to me today? That's why we come in to church, and not a man, not a woman, not the young, the old, the black, the white, the brown, the educated, the uneducated. None of that matters. What matters is us hearing from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful that we get to come into your house tonight. Oh, Lord, it's such a joy to lift our hearts and lift our hands, to stir ourselves up, God, and to get into your presence. God, tonight as we open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Open our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Tonight, Lord, we truly didn't come to hear from a man or a woman. God, we came to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, be welcome in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, also we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, they're our brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anyone else. We see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom. That's yours. So God, we'd ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters. Bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel, Harvest, for Oak Valley, for the Well and the Way, for Ecclesia, Emmanuel Baptist, and Trinity, God. Too many churches to name by name, but God, if they're preaching your gospel, we bless them. We bless the Adventist brothers and sisters and Catholic brothers and sisters, Lord. Thank you for the Foursquare denomination, God, and the Assemblies, Lord, for victory, God. All the great churches that are preaching your gospel, lifting up the name of Jesus, we bless them as you bless us. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. amen. I'm going to talk to our sound department for a second. There is a, a cycle hum up here. Okay, looks like they're on it. Praise the Lord. That was going to just drive me bonkers if I had to preach through that. So tonight, I want to talk to you about a subject called After Your Armor is On. Now, I want you to notice uh, in the title, I kind of gave you a little hint uh, to, as to where we're going, dot, 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 because tonight, we're going to talk about what to do after your armor is on is on. We can find in the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, if you want to turn there with me, about the armor of God, great section of scripture. And most of us know it. Most of us know that we should be wearing it. Most of us know, uh, you know, what to do with it, that sort of a thing. But there's something else that, that I believe that the spirit of God wants to speak to us tonight about what to do after your armor's on. There's something that we have to do. There's something that we have to uh, have an attitude about. There's something that we have to uh, make sure that we understand so that after our armor's on, we'll be standing when the fight's over. Are you listening tonight? Ephesians, the sixth chapter, we're going to start in verse number 10, if you will. Ephesians 6, chapter, verse 10, we're going to read through verse number 19. We're going to draw some truths out as we go. Ephesians, chapter 6, verse number 10 says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Everybody say, be strong in the Lord. Lord. See, first of all, we got to understand that this is not about us being strong in our own strength. Because I'm so mighty, I'm so educated, I'm so wonderful, I'm so cool or smart or nice or talented. It's going to get the job done. No, not going to work, not going to make it. What's going to make it is be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse number 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, maybe you didn't know it coming into this place tonight, but there is an enemy of your soul that's out there. He's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, the Bible says. The Bible also says that we're not unaware of his devices. Our society would like to tell us that there is no devil, that that's just a fairy tale, that that's not real. Well, listen, you can go on ignoring him while he eats you alive, but I choose to believe what the Bible says. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ went to the cross, why? To defeat the works of the devil. 
and to release those who are subject to bondage all their lives. If you take one away, then you don't have the whole truth any longer. You've got part of the story, and you may go to heaven, but you're going to live miserable here on the earth because the devil is going to knock you from pillar to post if you just ignore him or bury your head in the sand and say, there is no devil, he doesn't exist. It doesn't work. The devil is real. Jesus talked about him. Old and New Testament. Jesus talked to him in the New Testament. I mean, come on, is Jesus crazy? No. He's the Almighty. He's God in the flesh. He's the person of truth, and therefore, he's not going to lie to us. He's going to steer us in the right direction. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. In other words, there is a uh, spiritual demonic order and organization that's been around for a long, long time, that's been studying humanity, that knows our moves, knows our, uh, our looks, now can't read your mind or anything like that, but understands human nature, understands different things, can put thoughts into our minds, can whisper little things to us, like burning little coals being thrown into your thinking. Those things can be planted into the, the minds of men and women. And so, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. In other words, if you're having a bad day, your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not your spouse. Your enemy is not your children. Your enemy is not the sinners that are out there in the world. Your enemy is not the politicians. The, your enemy is not the guy at the grocery counter that gave you a hard time. No, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of weakness in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore, because we're in a battle, take up the whole armor of God. Not half, not three quarters, not 99.9%. .9%. No, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. How many of you know that the days are evil? Okay, and we got to withstand. And having done all, to stand. In other words, there's a part that we play. Having done all. God does all, we do all. There's a partnership that's taking place. God's going to do his part. we got to get in there and do our part. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now that was a, a mouthful. That was a lot. We could spend weeks and have spent in the past in this church weeks and even months on these uh, subjects, on these verses. Uh, you can get a hold of those CDs at the CD counter if you want to find out more about that. But let me just give you a quick uh, overview and then we'll get into what we're going to talk about. Because he says, I want you to put on your armor. Now he starts out with the armor in verse number 13, he says, having done all the stand, verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. See, truth holds us together. Like we talked about, Jesus is the person of truth. And as you wrap Jesus around your life, now you are stable, you're strong, you're steady. You know, the belt back in these days wasn't like the belt that we have that just holds up our pants, you know, or as a fashion statement. Their belt literally girded them. It, it, it was like a girdle, if you get that word. You know what I mean? It, it supported them. It held them together. They could put their money bag in it. They could put their sword in it. Uh, they could tuck their, their uh, you know, their clothes into it so that they could run, that sort of a thing. Their, their belt literally held them together. Let truth hold you together. Let the truth of God's word hold your life together. Having your waist girded about with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What covers your heart is the righteousness of God, that you are in the right position as well as the right practice with God. That's going to guard you. I love the verse in uh, the book of Proverbs in the New International Version. It says, righteousness guards the man of integrity. See, nothing can come against your heart when you've got righteousness on. And then it goes on and it says, verse 15, and having shod your feet, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We need to always be prepared to go and do what God has called us to do, to go and preach the gospel, to, to go out and tell someone about Jesus. It is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, which 
you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Remember, we talked about those little thoughts that the devil's trying to throw at you. It's almost like he's got these little flaming missiles he's trying to send into your thinking to explode on the inside of you and to just wreck you, get you all messed up, get you thinking about that thing. Have uh, whatever thought processes you had going on completely destroyed. But see, if you lift up your shield, taking up the shield, you've got to get a hold of that shield of faith. And as you lift that up, those fiery darts are going to hit that shield and they're going to be quenched. What does that mean? The fire goes out, they're going to bounce off, and they're not going to be effective at all in your life. Taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. See, when you're saved, now you've got a saved mind, a saved thinking. Your mind is renewed to the word of God. And now that covers your head and protects you. No longer are you operating the old ways and the old man and the old thinking. No, now you're linked up with the spirit of God and his will and his way. Finally, it says in the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now we understand that that sword, Jesus uh, has a, a sword coming out of his mouth in the book of Revelation. And when Jesus was battling the devil, he didn't pull out a physical sword. No, he said, it is written. And he started to speak the word of God out of his mouth. And every time it was as if Jesus took a physical sword out and it is written, whoosh, it is written, whoosh, it is written, whoosh, and then the devil had to run away. He had to flee and look for an opportune time. Why? Because Jesus had that sword of the Spirit coming out of his mouth. See, sometimes if the devil comes knocking and you've got your face shield up, you've got your armor on, hey, not, not enough just to sit there and, and take it. No, take out your sword. And when the devil comes at you with a dart, you come at him with the sword. No, devil, it is written. And you start to declare the word of God out of your mouth. And that sharp two-edged sword will come out and it will divide and it will take out the enemy. So now we know what it is. Now we understand that. But what do we do after the armor's on? What to do after your armor's on? Now I've got the, remember I said the dot, 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 that little ellipsis or whatever it's called. After your armor is on, first one for tonight is stay connected to God. Remember we said this, you're not at this alone. You're not going to get out there and do this in your own strength. The only way that the armor does you any good is if you're connected to the Lord. Think about it like a, uh, a vacuum cleaner. That vacuum cleaner will only be effective if it's plugged into the wall. Is that right? It doesn't do anything unless it's connected to the power source. The moment that you disconnect, no more suction. No more effectiveness. Same thing with our lives. We have to stay connected to the power source. we got to keep ourselves in connection with God. And, and if we've got our spiritual armor on... That's great, but we've got to stay connected to the Lord. That's why it says in, in verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I, I looked this verse up in the Amplified Bible because I wanted to say this point a little bit louder. And in the Amplified Bible, that's a joke, by the way. In the Amplified Bible, it says this. Okay, I'll put it up on the overheads for you so you can read along on the overheads. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 in the Amplified, it says, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord. And now it gives you a little parentheses. It expands on it. That's why it's called Amplified. It gives you a little bit more. Be empowered through your union with him. In other words, don't find your strength in yourself. Find your strength in himself. Are you listening? Stay connected to the power source. Be empowered through your union with him. Draw your strength from him, that strength which his boundless might provides. Now, my Bible says that my God is a warrior. Is that what your Bible says? Mighty to save, mighty in battle, that he rides on the clouds and when his feet touch the mountains, they melt like wax. That he draws his bow and his arrows go flying forward and they flash like lightning. My goodness, you look at that. Let me ask you a question in this place tonight. I want you to answer the question, okay? You didn't come to sit in a seat and stare at me. Praise God came to participate. You are the church, so you've got to participate now. So, okay, everybody's got their attention here. How mighty is God? How powerful is God? Well, how much ability does God have? I mean, come on now. Is God's strength sapped? Does God ever get tired? Does God ever grow weary? Does God sleep? Does God slumber? Can God take care of your problems? Does God have limitless power? That's my God. See, that's your God. So when we disconnect from the power source, not going to work. 
You got to stay connected. Otherwise, if we disconnect, we'll end up like Samson. Remember Samson? After he got a haircut. What happened? He disconnected from what was keeping him strong. Is that right? And what did he say when, when, when little Miss Thing woke him up? Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He got up and he said, I'll go out like I used to. Oh, no, but Samson, you've disconnected from the power source. And what happened? They put him in chains and put his eyes out. The Bible says his hair began to grow again. See, it, it, maybe you've disconnected tonight. I'm here to tell you there's good news for you. Get reconnected. Get back to where you need to be with God. You can get the power back. Don't stay disconnected. You know when you mess up? Anybody other than Pastor Dan, uh, brave enough to admit, because I'll admit it, my hand went up first. Anybody else want to admit, we messed up. Okay, see, in those times, you don't want to show your face in church, right? Why? Because you think everybody in the church is a prophet and they know what you did, right? And, and they got to they gotta be judging me. I just know, you know, church folk, they, I'm going to walk in and they're going to read it all over my face. And no, listen, we're all, we're all there. Confess it. Confess it to the Lord. Make restitution with who you need to make it with. And let's put it under the blood of Jesus. Allow him to cleanse you and reconnect. That, that means change. Repentance means I'm changing my mind. I realize I'm dumb. I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm going the wrong way. And now I'm going to turn away from where I was going. And I'm going to turn to where God has me to go. I'm going to reconnect with the power source. See, after the armor's on, you got to stay connected. Are you listening tonight? Second thing for tonight, it's just a simple gospel preaching message. Is that okay? Second thing tonight, after your armor is on, there's a fight ahead. I don't know anybody that puts on armor without a fight ahead. Is that right? Even if they're just putting the armor on to test it, how do you test armor? You go and you fight somebody, right? Hit me in the face. Let's see if it hurts. Ding, you know. Go ahead, give me one of the chests, you know. What are you doing? There's, there's something that's happening when you put your armor on. Every day, you need to recognize and realize that we're in a battle. There's an enemy of our soul that's out there prowling around, trying to get in our business, trying to mess things up, trying to screw us up, trying to get us off, trying to get us disconnected. Come on, somebody. And, and so, therefore, we need to recognize and realize when we put our armor on, after our armor on, that's when the fight happens. Look at the language used throughout this passage. Verse 11, it says, stand against. Verse number 12 says, wrestle against. Verse number 13 says, withstand, having done all to Stand. Verse number 14, stand therefore. See, there's some language, and really if you look at it, it's an escalating, progressive language that shows us about the fight. See, it, it may start with this, stand against. Right? You got your armor on. You're going throughout your day. Something happens that's ungodly, and you stand against it. You say, that's ungodly. What did you do? You stood up for what was right. You stood up for what was true. You stood up for your convictions, your godly convictions that came from the word of God. And you said, no. Now, the moment that happens, there's the fight. Is that right? The moment you stand up, the devil's going to try and knock you down. So now, all of a sudden, you're in a fight. So that's where the second verse comes in, verse number 12, where you wrestle against See, first, you may be sitting there, something happens, and you say, oh, no. Boom, that thing jumps on you, right? Now, all of a sudden, you're wrestling. Now, all of a sudden, you're punching. Now, all of a sudden, you're fighting. Now, you got your sword out. Now, you got your shield up. Now, you're kicking. Now, you're, you're scrapping, right? You're biting. You're doing whatever you can to make sure that you've got the victory. That's why it goes on, and look at what it says, withstand. You know what withstanding is? That's not a passive just holding a pose. No, that is active resistance against the enemy. 
In other words, devil, I'm not going to give you any foothold in my life. I stood up, I'm wrestling with you, but now I'm withstanding you. Here's the line drawn in the sand that you cannot cross, and therefore you will go no further. You're only coming to this point, and I'm not letting down, and I'm not letting up. I'm not giving up, because to get through me, you got to go through God. And then look at what it says next, having done all. See, you may have to. Spend all of your time, all of your willpower, and your resources in order to fight this good fight of faith. God is not looking for people who will fight for a little while and then sit on the side and bellyache and ball and squall. Well, I tried. I gave my best, you know, but I'm just out. I'm done. Down for the count. Got knocked down. Got a tooth knocked out, and I just can't handle this anymore. No, God is looking for the courageous People who will commit to fight until the end. People who are going to not let up, not quit. People who are going to go after it with tenacity and veracity. People who, who are looking into the face of the devil without fear. You know why you can do that? Because he's a defeated foe. He's already under your feet, the Bible says. All you're doing is enforcing the victory of Jesus Christ. So you withstand. You say no. And you draw that line and you hold that line. And then finally he says... Stand, therefore. In other words, at the end of the fight, you're going to be the one left victorious with your hand up, Jesus holding up your hand, and the devil is under your feet. Are you here tonight? Yes. Hallelujah. After your armor is on, here's where I really wanted to get tonight. I want to spend a little bit of time here. After your armor is on, look at this one. Pray. After your armor is on, Pray. If you were wondering, Pastor Dan, how do I punch the devil in the face? How do I pull out my sword and slice him and dice him? How do I kick him in the rear and kick him out of my life? Here's how. Pray. That is where the battle is fought. That is where the battle is won. It's in your prayers. Take a look at verse number 18 once again. Verse number 18, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, says this, praying always with all prayer. See, this verse comes after your armor is on. We know that after the armor is on, stay connected. We know after the armor is on, there's a fight coming. We know that. But this verse says, put on all this armor, praying always with all prayer. No longer are we in symbolic terminology, helmets and breastplates and swords and all that. kind. No, this is tangible. This is reality. This is where we fight. The battle is in our prayer life. We don't wrestle against God. No, we wrestle against the powers and the principalities and the powers of darkness. We come against those things. How? We pray. Pray, 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 pray. You guys hearing me tonight? See, I, I, I'm not a prayer person. I'm not one of those people that thrives on intercessory prayer and staying up in the middle of the night. You know, you wake me up in the middle of the night, uh, you're going to have a wrestling match on your hand. <laughs> and there's been times where I've come up against things, but I, I know I need to pray, and yet I've been too lazy to pray. That's just me. Of course, you guys are more spiritual, and so none of you have this issue. So it's just confession night with Pastor Dan here. But, 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 you know, I think God wants such a partnership and such an intimate union with us. And the way that that happens is in prayer. So you may go into your prayer closet defeated. You may go into your prayer closet wondering if your prayers are just hitting the roof, bouncing right back down on you. Does God hear? Does God see? But when you walk out of that prayer closet, you now have everything that you have need. You have won the battle. And he says there's many types of prayer. You know what type of prayer you should use? All of them. Plain and simple. If you get in your word, you will find, he says, supplications. He talks about asking prayers. Lord, I need this. God, will you supply that? Uh, prayer of agreement. Get somebody with you. Hey, will you agree with me in prayer? Yes, let's believe God for that together. The Bible says whatever you agree upon on earth is agreed upon in heaven. Listen, if my prayers are agreed upon in heaven, then I know I got them. Prayer in Jesus' name. Jesus said, ask anything in my name, and I will do it for you. 
Oh my goodness, that means that when I pray, I go to the Father and I pray in Jesus' name and then I know that I have, pray according to the will of God. Pray in the will of God. You know what's an easy way to pray the will of God? Pray his word. You know why? Because God said it, therefore he agrees with it. And the Bible says in 1 John, the fifth chapter, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we know that we have the petitions we have asked of him. Pray those prayers. Pray prayers of repentance. Pray prayers of faith. Pray prayers of thanksgiving. Prayers of praise. Prayers of lament. Did you know it's okay to go to God and say, God, I'm having a bad day? Sometimes we think we can't pray those prayers. We think that we've got to go to God so holy and so pious and so righteous that like it's our own thing. You know, oh, thou heavenly Father, God almighty, dear Lord Jesus, the most holy potentate, preeminent one, I come to you today and I give you my life. If it be your will, Lord, just do something, I hope. Amen. Amen. You know, and, it's, and God's going, shut up. I don't, I don't listen to those types of prayers, you know? I well, may not say that to you, but he said it to me when I do it. But in any event, God is saying, it's okay to be you when you come to me. Just don't leave the same connect with God. See, you'll find prayers. If you're having trouble praying, go get in the Psalms and listen to the voice of the cries of the men and women who have gone before us. Get into the book of Lamentations. Here's a man who is considered the weeping prophet pouring out his heart before God. See, there's a real raw type of prayer that you can get in with God and you can start to say, God, I'm a mess. Clean me up. God, I I'm angry, Lord. Help me to see clearly. God, I, I don't know what to do. I need direction. God, I'm just confused. Can you bring some clarity and shed some light? See, if you get real with God, the Bible says draw near to God, he will draw near to you. When you get real with God, you honor God. The Bible says you will be honored by God. He draws near and he will respond and meet you where you're at. That's our God, and that's where the victory is won. If there's obstacles in the way, it's in prayer that you move those obstacles. See, what good is it to speak to the mountain if you're speaking by yourself? No, you get God, and if God says, go ahead, speak, then you speak. Why? Because you're connected to the power source. Hello. Like what S.D. Gordon said, he said, prayer is striking the winning blow. Service is gathering up the results. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Did you catch that? Oswald Chambers, who wrote My Utmost for His Highest, said this. He said, get into the habit of dealing with God about everything. In other words, don't leave any rooms in your life locked and unavailable to God. Open it all up for Him. Throw open the curtains. Invite Him into every area of your life. Pastor, what if it hurts? It'll only hurt for a little while because God is the healer. And even though he may cut you open, he's going to sew you back up. And it'll be better on the other side than it was before. Get into the habit of dealing with God about everything. Unless in the first waking moment of the day you learn to fling the door wide back and let God in, you will work on a wrong level all day. But swing the door wide open and pray to your Father in secret, and every public thing will be stamped with the presence of God. Since it's confession night, can I make some confessions up in front of you tonight? Past couple days, I believe the reason why I have this message tonight is because the past couple days, I have woke up and hit the ground running and, and been like, Lord, you know, and I ran off. Now, now, sometimes that's okay, but, you know, past two days have been my days off. I've had time to pray, but I've just gotten busy about other things. And, and it's like Mary and Martha, right? Martha's busy about serving. All of a sudden, she's getting frustrated and telling God to do something about her sister, okay? That, that, that just is a perfect picture of how I know me personally and sometimes we can get when we don't pray is, God, I'm busy. I'm doing the work. I'm being dad. I'm running to soccer practice. I, I'm going over here. I need to go to the bank, God. God, I, I need to make sure my finance is order. God, you're asking me to tithe. And, and would you take care of all these other Christians? They're crazy, God. And God said, wait a second. Hold up. Time out. You're busy with much serving, and yet they've chosen the needful thing. This morning I got up. And the first place I went was to my knees, and I repented and said, Lord, I am so sorry. Please forgive me, God. I have not prayed like I need to pray. Did you know today was a much better day than the past couple of days? 
Today was a much better day. Today I didn't get irritated with the kids. Today, you know, I was working today too, but you know, <laughs> when I was with them, they were wonderful angels, you know. But, but see, God takes those things and he'll give you extra patience. God will give you extra blessing. God will give you extra wisdom. God will give you whatever. See, that's in prayer, that's where the battle is fought. If you're coming up against a spirit of anger, a spirit of lust, or a spirit of depression, or whatever those things are, if you neglect prayer, you're neglecting what you're putting your armor on for. Because he says, praying always with all prayer and supplications. And then he goes on, he says, pray for other people. Sometimes when you pray for other people and you get unselfish, it unlocks and releases things inside of yourself. And as well, can I tell you this? The Bible commands us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That law is love, and it's the bond of unity and peace that brings us together. And when you're connected with other, see, it's like being on the battlefield with other warriors. Can't tell you how many times I've just been in prayer, and the Lord's placed somebody on my heart, and I prayed for them, lifted them up, and then I didn't see them for a while, and then I saw them and said, hey, I was praying for you the other day. And they said, oh, man, thank you so much. You don't even know what was going on. It's the will of the Lord in prayer. After your armor is on. Pray. Last one for tonight. After your armor is on. After your armor is on, enlist help. We started to go there a little bit just a moment ago. But I, I love the fact that the apostle leaves us an example in the word, that God contained these scriptures and shows us a, a man that we look at and, and we look at with respect. I, I totally just look at the Apostle Paul and I say, my goodness, you know, this guy was spiritual. This guy, uh, you know, heard from the Lord. This guy had unusual encounters, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, you know. He had the signs of an apostle. This guy was shipwrecked. He was snake bit. He was beaten and left out for dead. He was stoned. He was uh, just, I mean, all this stuff happened to this guy. He was persecuted. People followed him from city to city resisting his ministry. Uh, he, he turned the world upside down. I mean, this guy had, had riots because he was trying to come in and preach. And I look at all that, and, and, and here's a man who was educated and, and was blessed, and this guy, uh, you know, was a hard worker, and he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. My goodness, to be used by God like that. And yet, look at what he says in verse number 19. First couple of words in the verse number 19. Look at this. And for me. He just said, pray always with all prayer and supplication and pray for the saints, pray for everybody else. And we get that. But then he turns around and he says, I want you guys to pray for me. The great apostle humbles himself and asks in a letter where he's giving them instructions and revealing to them the mysteries of God. And he turns around and he says, can you guys pray for me? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness goodness, how often have I needed prayer that have been too prideful to say, can you pray for me? Can, can, can you just give me a little bit of that? Can, can, can you remember me? Can you remind the Lord about what's going on in my life? I mean, sometimes I, I think we think of ourselves as such spiritual giants that if we ask for prayer that we're less of a Christian. And yet if the great apostle this great man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament was used by God to do unusual miracles. Now, miracles in themselves are unusual, but then you add the word unusual to miracles, and he really had something going on. If he can ask for prayer, how much more us? How much more should we reach out to the people around us, people in church, people sitting in front and beside you, people that you know are faith-filled and faithful, People who can, who can lift you up and encourage you and pray prayers of faith and ask God for the right things in your life. Who can be led by the Spirit of God to pray the right prayer, to pray in the God prayer for your life. See, that's, we have several avenues. Prayer teams right up here in church right afterwards. They'll stand and pray with you tonight. Tonight. Prayer cards out there in the foyer. You can go fill out a prayer request. And hundreds of people from the rock, including all the pastors, get those prayer requests. And we pray for you. We lift you up on a daily basis. Lift you up by name. My goodness. See, the apostle goes on and asks, and look at what he says. Pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He's asking for them to pray for him to have courage to do his God assignment. Isn't that interesting? See, because he was in a battle, remember. He was in a battle. He was in a fight, and he realized his fight wasn't against 
flesh and blood. He wasn't mad at the Jews who came at him. He wasn't fighting against them. He wasn't fighting against the Gentiles. He wasn't fighting against those people who were worshiping other gods at that time. He wasn't fighting those people. He wasn't fighting the people who opposed him and the sorcerers and the different people who, who came against him. He wasn't fighting against those people. He was fighting a spiritual fight. He had his armor on and he enlisted help from others. My God assignment's big and I need help. Can you pray for me that I will complete my God assignment? Church, we need your prayers. Rock Church and World Outreach Center needs your prayers. I, Pastor Dan, need your prayers. Pastor Luke, Pastor Jim, Pastor Deborah, all of our pastoral staff need your prayers. Our, 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 our leaders and our volunteers, we need your prayers. Uh, uh, our children's ministry workers and nursery workers, rocking babies, we need your prayers. Church, let's get in the fight together. Let's do this arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. Because after the armor is on, that's when the action happens. And I didn't put on armor to just go play. Well, hit me in the face and let's see if it hurts. No, I put on my armor because there's an enemy out there that's taking people out. And I'm not going to put up with that from any devil. I'm not going to stand for that in this valley or in this nation or in this world. I'm not going to let him get away with it. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus has ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand. And now there's a message that needs to get out. And even though there's resistance, we're going to fight the good fight of faith because we win. In and we'll be standing at the end. Tonight, what did we learn after your armor's on? Number one, stay connected to God. Number two, there's a fight ahead. Get ready for it. It's going to happen. Number three, pray. And number four, enlist help. Did you guys get something from the word tonight? Come on, let's give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys about your life before you go. I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart's right with God. I'm going to ask everybody, please remain seated during this time. Tons of people got up and left already. If you're out there in the foyer, if you're in the breezeways, within the sound of my voice, I want you to just stop right where you're at and listen up. If you're in the bathrooms, hey, I know you can hear me in there too. It's a captive audience. But listen up. Let's talk about your life. Don't want you to think about anyone else, anything else right now. Just focus in because God wants to speak to you right where you're at. I want to ask you a question about your life. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. Here's the question. What if tonight was your last night? Where would you end up? Just answer this question in your heart. You don't have to answer out loud, just in your heart. No, 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 the answer, but you and God. What if tonight was your last night on the earth? Where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer it right now in your heart. Heaven or hell? Now, sometimes people answer that question and say, well, I think I would go to heaven. I, I think so. Some of you might have said this. You might have said, well, I hope I'd go to heaven. I really do hope so. Some of you said, maybe I'd go to heaven. I really don't know. The problem with that thinking is that you've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And you can't think, hope, or maybe your way into the kingdom of God. You got to make sure. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, you know, I, I know that hell's not real. It's just a fairy tale that people tell their kids to make them be good. And so I'm not going to hell. I'm, I'm going to go to heaven because hell's not real. Problem with that is that hell is real. It's a very real place. It's all through the Bible you can find out about hell. Old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of it. So you're not going to avoid hell just by denying its existence. It doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to face the reality of it. And what makes you think that you're going to go to heaven instead of going to hell? Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. God's a good God, and he's loving, and, and Jesus went to the cross. Therefore, all roads lead to heaven. You do your thing. I can do my thing. The churches, however they want to do their thing, as long as they stay true to themselves, they get to go to heaven. Is that right? I'm wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible to say all roads lead to heaven? It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You're not going to get to the moon driving around the earth. You can drive around the earth as long as you want, but you're not going to make it to heaven. There's one way you've got to get there. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. 
And don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloodied, and hung on the cross, don't you think after he went through all that, that he'd let us know how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. Now, sometimes people hear that and they say, that's good news, Pastor, because I know God lets good people into heaven. I, you know, I haven't always been good. I was bad, but I cleaned up my act and now I'm good. And really, my good outweighs my bad, you know, and... and uh, I've been a good person, nice to my neighbors, helped out, gave money to charities, got involved in social justice causes, that sort of a thing. And, and God sees that and appreciates that, and he'll let me in because I'm good. But the problem with that thinking is that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say that you get to go to heaven because you've been good. Nowhere in the Bible does it say because your good outweighs your bad or you clean up your act or because you give money to charity, help out, be nice to your neighbors or get involved in social justice, that you get to go to heaven. In fact, if you'd read your Bible, you know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you're not going to get there on your own goodness. The Bible tells us that our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. Not going to get to stay, going to be thrown out. Can't get to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I was raised in church. Parents told me you were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslims, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say your parents will raise you in church, tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian as a child, attend religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism class, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And nowhere, check it out, nowhere do I see in the Bible that because you're born in America or because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. Come on, tonight, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I I get all that, but not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church in front of you right now, and, and I consider myself to be a Christian. Now, that's great, and I'm glad you're here tonight, but you know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's not there. Any more than you can go to your garage at home, sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Now, we understand that concept and that principle, but what makes us think it's any different if we sit in church service, call ourselves a Christian, and that makes us a Christian? It doesn't work like that. Some of you said, Pastor, I, I get that thinking, but you don't understand. My last church I got involved, I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church and taught in the Bible classes. Now, while that's great, I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, sing in the choir. People think of you as a leader, teach in the Bible classes, you get to go to heaven. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere. You find God waiting at the gates of heaven, Looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. Come on, let's talk about your eternal life. Some of you said, well, Pastor, okay, I get all that, but you don't understand. I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection. Sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. No, that's great, and I'm glad you did those things. Just, just show that to me in the Bible. You know, if you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. If you'd read your Bible, you know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures. That's recorded in your Bible. And yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. Jesus was talking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus, let me tell you about him for a second, because he was a good guy, did a lot of good deeds, raised up in his church called the synagogue. He attended, he got involved, he helped out. Uh, He eventually became one of the leaders. He taught other people about the scriptures and about God. We would have thought of anybody, this guy was good enough, attended enough church and did enough, knew enough God that when Jesus spoke to him, he would have patted him on the back and said, Nicodemus, man, hey, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. But he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of God? You must be born again. Now, I know our society has made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it to the coals, made it out to be something that is not goofy, weirdo stuff. Listen, let's not let society... Books, Hollywood, television, the movies, or the internet define for us what being born again is. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart. 
and that you've given God all of your life. That's simple. All or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross and graphic words for the mouth of Jesus. But what is he saying, lukewarm? What's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out. A little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call. Your choice. I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Here's your opportunity in a moment. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again. Headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. And you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be embarrassed. Let's get over that tonight. Because remember, the enemy of your soul, the devil, he's trying to push you out of this. I'm putting the heat on you, trying to push you into this. Why? Because I want to manipulate you? No, because heaven is a real place. And I don't want you to miss out on it. I don't want you to go to hell any more than you want you to go to hell. But listen, more than both of us, God doesn't want you there. That's why he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Public spectacle for all to see. And now what he asks of you is the same thing that he gave you. He gave you all of his heart. He gave you all of his life. Now he's asking the same from you. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? In this safe and friendly place, will you just lift your hand and acknowledge your need for Jesus? Saying, I need to give him that tonight. I'm ready and willing to do that. I'll see your hand go up, I'll count it, put it right down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are embarrassed, it's better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to land in hell forever and ever and ever. And no one would make that trade. No one. Tonight, you don't have to do that. You can get right with God. No one's judging you. No one's criticizing you. No one's condemning you. I aired all my dirty laundry tonight. You know you're not in a place filled with perfect people. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And he's here tonight to rescue you from hell, to take you off the course that you're on, and to get you on the path with God. Tonight, in this safe and friendly place, who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and given them all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, get ready to get your hand up, acknowledging your need for Jesus. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're out watching by television, in the foyer, in the Love Rock Cafe, if you're out there in the breezeways, get ready to get your hand up. God sees, God's watching, then you can come into the church service right afterwards or tell an usher. And they'll let you back into the church service online. Hey, wherever you're at, all over the world or across the nation, get ready to get your hand up. God is watching you wherever you're at. And then on our homepage, you can click the button that says respond to God. Or if you're watching on your uh, screen and you can see the blue button that says respond to God, you can click that and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. Get ready to get your hands up all together on the count of three if you need to do this. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. God bless you. Three, four, five. Thank you. Five. Thank you. Who else? Six. Got you over here. Down here. Seven. Got you over there. Who else? There's seven wise people tonight. Anybody else that I did not already see? you saying, yeah, I need to do this. There's seven wise people in the place tonight. Anybody else real quick, just raise it up high for me right now if that's you. Raise it up high for me. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, yeah, you should. Go for it. Go for it. God just spoke to you. He just read your mail. If that's what you're thinking. Do I need to do this? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Come on, put your hand up right now. If that's you. Who else tonight? There's seven wise people. You won't be alone. And I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. So come on. If you know you need to do this, just pop your hand up. Who else tonight? We'll just wait a couple more moments and then we'll close it up. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? Anybody else in these center sections? Who else tonight? You're saying, yeah, yeah, that's me, Pastor. I need to do that. Anybody else? All right. 
I'm going to close this up, but listen, you still haven't missed out. All seven of you, and guess what? There's twice as many that need to come. There's seven more you need to come. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a shout. We'll lead in a song. As we do that, I want you to stand to your feet. Once you get in the aisle, I want you to meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do that until we get you down here. So if you raised your hand or if you should have raised your hand, let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. You come. Come on down. Oh, come just as you are. Make your way to the front right now. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. The spirit come. come on down. Oh, come just as you are. Come and see. Come on, come on, come on. You can come too from the family rooms. You can bring your children. They'll remember this. Come and live forever. Let's give him a hand. You can come too. Come on down. The living water, and you'll never thirst again. If you guys will just give me a couple moments, I need to go after some more souls. I believe that there are three more that you need to come. Three more. There's one in this section, one in this section, and I believe one in this section. And if you know you need to come in these other sections and you're saying, Pastor Dan, you missed me, God just spoke to your heart right now and said, no, he didn't. You can come too. But definitely, you guys need to come. So I'm going to ask Cameron to sing that one more time. We're not going to clap. We're just going to listen for the Spirit's voice right now. And if you know that's you, God's tugging at your heart. Just slip out in the aisle and make your way up front right now. Just come right now. Go ahead and sing, Cameron. give you life everlasting strength for two.
while I'm talking, if you know that you need to do it, your heart's pounding out of your chest, and you know it's you. I mean, come on. You know it's you. If that's you, I'm going to give some instructions right now. But I don't want you to miss out, and I don't want you to feel like you can't come because I started talking. So get your stuff. Get in the aisle. And just come right now while I give instructions to these guys, okay? Hey, you guys. Thank God you guys have come. We're so excited for all of you guys. It's the best decision of your entire life right here. You can put a smile on your face. You're making a wise choice, all right? Now, right over here to my right, your left. See this guy waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird goes on, okay? You already made it past me. I'm about as weird as you're going to encounter tonight, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things with you. I want to let you know what they are. Okay? In advance so that you're not wondering, oh my goodness, are they going to take me in the back and beat me up or something like that? Okay? Not going to do any of that. What we're going to do is three things. First of all, we're going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, brand new on the inside, okay? Secondly, he's going to give you some free literature, some free information to take home, read about what you just did and what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next, okay? And then thirdly, he's going to talk to you about a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Heard of a physical trainer in the gym? Helps you get strong, right? Spiritual Personal Trainer will do that for you spiritually. It's one-on-one. It's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Now, let me make a promise to you guys, okay? Here's the promise. Give us one year of your life here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center consistently. If you can come on Wednesday nights every week, come on Wednesday nights every week, one year. If you can come Wednesdays and Sundays or Wednesdays and Saturdays, uh, Wednesdays and Fridays or whatever, uh, just give us a year. Get into church as often as you can. We have 11 church services a week. Okay, so we're working hard for you. Get into as many of those as you can consistently. And after that year and for the rest of your life, you'll say, my goodness, I am so blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Okay, that's the promise. I was just talking to a couple last week. They said the month of November is their one-year anniversary. And I asked them, I said, I got I to gotta ask you. Is it true? Did the promise come to pass or am I a liar? They said, oh, no, pastor. It's totally true. So watch what God is going to do in your life. You guys can make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.